Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. And by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. And by the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Office of the State Aquaculture Coordinator, supporting the viability and vitality of Washington agriculture. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gordson and welcome to Washington Grown. Travel to the west side of the state and the smell of the ocean air will definitely make you want to try some fresh Washington seafood. And our state is home to some of the best seafood in the world. In this episode, we're going to be exploring Washington aquaculture. We'll cook mussels in Seattle's favorite seafood restaurant, Ivor's Acres of Clams. And the reason we always have two beers out because you're supposed to be drinking one while you cook, but you know, it's a little early yet for some people. <laughs> and Tomas will learn about an up and coming farm fish. And that is your black cod. Then it's out on the water to see how mussels grow at Penn Cove. Well, this doesn't look like a really big mussel, you know, but if we open it up, I mean, it's a full Hi. and beautiful mussel there. All that and much more today on Washington Grown. Bon appetito! There are no fingers in there. No either, fingers so in it, and they, and they still look green. <laughs> this is happy food right here. That is heaven on a fork. <laughs> look at that smile! <laughs> oh, I've never done that before. Got my hard hat on. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Whether this is your 10th trip to Seattle or your first time ever, Ivers Acres of Clams is a destination you don't want to miss. Quirky, fun, and loaded with Seattle history, this iconic restaurant has everything you need for an authentic Seattle experience. It's a cool breeze, there's an ocean view, you can see the boat. When you talk about classic Seattle cuisine, you have to talk about Ivers. It's huge. We think it's the biggest restaurant in Seattle. CEO Bob Donegan brings the fun to Ivers through humor and friendliness, just like founder Ivor Heglin did many years ago. He loved to entertain. Whenever there was an opportunity for him to earn publicity, he would do so. When the railroad trains across the street here spilled corn syrup on the waterfront, he raced in and had Chef Seidenquest make him big pancakes, and he ladled fresh corn syrup on uh, pancakes and said, come to Ivers, we don't skimp on the syrup. We know that part of the fun of Ivers is being quirky and bringing excitement to the community. So we're always looking for a little strange things. The chowder, man, I tell you, they know how to do it up. Now remember, Ivers won't allow your husband to have more than two cups of clam nectar without your <laughs> written permission. I came here one time when I was on a work trip, loved it have to come back. We're from Florida. We came from California. We're from the UK originally. We're heading on an Alaskan cruise. In this restaurant at the center of the Seattle waterfront, during the summer, the average distance a customer travels to get here is 504 miles. Gotta go to Ivers. Gotta go to Ivers. <laughs> I love it. Later in the show, I'll be cooking Penn Cove mussels with executive chef Chris Gar. And the reason we always have two beers out because you're supposed to be drinking one while you cook, but you know, it's a little early yet for some people. <laughs> Today I'm out on the waters off of Whidbey Island visiting Penn Cove shellfish, where people like farm manager Tim Jones work hard to grow world famous mussels. Why would you say that Penn Cove mussels are so famous? I mean, they're world famous. They are world famous. Well, they taste really good. We only harvest mussels that we sell. So it's not like a fishery where you go harvest and you try to sell everything, you know. We actually sell the product, then we harvest it. I see. You know? So the mussels that we're harvesting today are going to be someone's lunch plate tomorrow in Seattle. It's going to be someone's dinner plate in New York City. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's that's pretty fresh. That is fresh. Yeah. So they grow on rafts? Well, they grow on lines that hang off, off the rafts. rafts. Okay. So in April, we hang out our collector lines. And we hang these lines off of all these rafts. And basically, we just have to wait. Hopefully, they're going to hang on to our collector lines. Yeah. They're going to hang on to the bottom of this boat, to the sides of the rafts. They're going to be everywhere. They'll find something. Now, it's on to our first raft to see how mussels start from the sea. We've taken these lines and we've coiled them. And then once we've collected it, we are going to come back, cut these zip ties, remove the zip ties, and let it all the way out. 
The reason we coil the lines, the highest density of larvae is that first meter of water. And I can see we do have some, oh, look at that. some seed here. You can yeah. have this. It's free. This is looking pretty good. We got a good set this nice. year. Nice. Oh yeah, next year's gonna Chocolate, be good. Guys. Now it's off to another raft to see more developed lines. Right now, the muscles are small and everybody has room to hang on to that line. But as they grow more and more out, you know, they're gonna go further and further away from the line. So what we did, we invented these discs that go in about every foot, and that gives it the muscles uh, support as they grow horizontally. This line actually has too many muscles on oh, it. Oh, does it? Okay. It does. And we're actually gonna strip all the muscles off this line. Oh. And then we're gonna re-sock them, we call it, onto other identical lines. So that one of these lines should make me three or four harvest lines. So one raft of seed like this will turn into four rafts of harvest and we'll spread our seed out. There's the mouth of the Skagit River. Yeah. And it's bringing all this nutrient-rich water from the Cascade Mountains. It basically kind of spills it into Penn Cove. Uh -huh. The added sunlight, because we're in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountain Range, it just makes a great place for algae. And that's what mussels love to eat. Now we're boarding the harvest vessel, where mussels are removed from their lines, cleaned, and packaged. We have some really stubborn barnacles we're gonna try to scrape off. The machines just won't get off. But at the end, we have to eventually just take them off by hand. Then the mussels are bagged up, ready for the market. Oh, she's like, you're gonna keep going? <laughs> some of these will be in Seattle tomorrow for lunch, and some will be in New York City for dinner. You know, it doesn't look like a really big mussel, you know, but if we open it up, I mean, it's a full nice. and beautiful mussel there. It's a farm, you know, right. we have crops out here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're tending to our crops. You know, we're gonna start the same thing, little tiny seeds, mm -hmm. like, a, like a dirt farm that starts. Yeah. Like, Make sure everything's growing correctly. You know, we're gonna tend to that crop right. throughout the year, then we're gonna harvest. So it's really pretty pretty similar. Yeah. It's just you don't see it like uh, right. like like you do on a like dirt plowing farm. a field or exactly. harvesting the wheat or yeah. The grow exactly. The water. Right. But it's the same, it's the same yeah. process. Plus it's like a little flavor sponges, right? Yeah, they kind of hold they on to the bring the ingredients yeah. that you cook them with. You kind of look at shellfish. Oh, the, Try. Right. You gotta really like it. From the field to the docks, farms can come in all shapes and sizes. That's why I'm talking with Laura Butler, Aquaculture Coordinator for WSDA. So describe what aquaculture actually is. Well, it's uh, farming um, in underwater, basically. Uh -huh. So that includes fin fish, shellfish, mussels, clams, oysters, gooey duck, as well as seaweed, algae, um, and kelp. The aquaculture coordinator position is newly developed, designed to be a resource for growers across the state. So what exactly does an aquaculture coordinator do? This industry is uh, not only permitted on the local level, state level, but also the federal level as well. And so we have to have a number of different permits in order to um, be able to farm. You know, it's everything from having, you know, navigation obstacles to protecting clean water as well as protecting human health at the product they're harvesting. They touch on more agencies than almost any other industry in Washington in terms of permitting, so it can be really complex for them to navigate, so we'll help them through that process yeah. as well. WSDA also focuses on marketing to help growers sell their product. Part of that marketing is uh, working with our foreign trade partners and um, connecting growers with those foreign trade partners. And then we also work domestically to tell the story of aquaculture, talk about its history, talk about the importance of aquaculture for a clean environment. Why is aquaculture a big deal here in Washington? Well, Washington is the number one producer of aquaculture products in the country. Washington's known uh, throughout the world as having some of the cleanest and best um, seafood out there. But beyond that, aquaculture in Washington has a rich history. I think one of the coolest things about aquaculture in Washington is that it's one of the oldest, um, you know, exported products out of Washington. We've been commercially farming um, shellfish in the state since the mid-1800s, but culturally it's been significant um, for our tribes for thousands of years. Um, so it's one of the, the part of Washington's heritage. Aside from permits, there are other obstacles that aquaculture farmers have to face as well. They rely on clean water, so they're big advocates for the clean water and clean environment. So they're um, you know, always working to protect the water um, and working to you know, make sure that things are cleaned up, that we're not having pollution and protecting the environment as well. Do you have a favorite? Seafood? <laughs> I don't know if I can claim a favorite. I really like gooey duck. Do you? Yeah, yeah. gooey duck ceviche is yeah. probably my favorite. Yeah, good stuff. Although I'm a big oyster fan as well. Uh -huh. I like all seafood. Yeah. So.
So how much water does a mussel filter in a day? I'll have the answer after the break. Coming up, we're in the kitchen at Ivers, cooking up some Pen Cove mussels. All shellfish, when it's cooked, it'll pop open. They're yeah. graceful. Yeah, they're like the flower in the morning when it sees yeah. the sun. And we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest, trying out some spring pea green curry with black cod and strawberry. An adult mussel will filter 18 gallons of water per day. Today, we're headed to Seattle's quirkiest restaurant on the pier, Ivers Acres of Clams. This iconic landmark has a rich history of entertainment, pranks, and Seattle culture. It's an iconic place in Seattle. It's got a great feel. It's very comfortable. I mean, when you talk about classic Seattle cuisine, you have to talk about Ivers. Ivers is synonymous with Seattle, it seems like. We call ourselves that? Seattle's original seafood restaurant. CEO Bob Donegan carries Ivers' name by bringing founder Ivor Hagland's humor and fun-loving nature into the restaurant business. He loved to entertain. Every Christmas, he would load Patsy the Seal into a baby buggy and wheel her up to Frederick and Nelson to take pictures with Santa. Yeah, why not? We know that part of the fun of Ivers is being quirky and bringing excitement to the community, so we're always looking for a little strange things. We were gonna get the walking clams, but they weren't available. <laughs> it's a piece of Seattle history, the exposed wall, the, the photos that go back to throughout the maritime of this region and Seattle. The food is amazing. The chowder, man, I tell you, they know how to do it up. What makes your clam chowder special? Well, there's a secret ingredient in it. Ah. Bacon. So <laughs> yeah. bacon makes everything taste Bacon's better, right? Bacon's the secret ingredient. I mean, as, as a local, I have it in my fridge. I buy it in the stores. It's the first thing I eat when I come back into town. It's really delicious. We love local stuff. We buy about two million pounds of Washington, Washington State Garden. potatoes a year for french fries. It can't get fresher or more local yeah. than what we do here. Gotta go to Ivers. Gotta go to Ivers. <laughs> I love it. Seattle's original seafood yeah. restaurant. Now we're ready to cook with executive chef Chris Gar using Pen Cove mussels. Pairing a great protein like that with another great protein and then, you know, who doesn't like beer? Right. Except for people that don't like beer. <laughs> well, let's get started. You can do the onion. No. Oh. I have onion phobia. No. Un onion phobia? I'm not, I'm not very good at cutting onion. <laughs> I get the little knife. <laughs> well, I do need them both. Oh, okay. Pen Cove is essential in this whole thing, right? Absolutely. Those guys work way too hard. The one thing that's great about these guys, they're a filter. Yeah, they okay? filter, right, so, exactly. so they keep those waters clean, so the more that we grow and the faster, the, you know, the more stuff that comes through there, they're filtering that out, and then we eat them, and yeah. then we get healthy, you know, it's all it's the circle of life. The circle of life. You know, the difference between, like, mussels and clams is clams have their own unique flavor, mm -hmm. whereas mussels, you want to put a wine with it, you want to put a beer with it, you want to put vodka with it. Anything that I like to drink, I've cooked mussels. Yeah. They get okay. drunk. So it, it helps. <laughs> better them than you, maybe. Uh, you know, <laughs> Question. work in the kitchen right. long enough, it's better you too, so. Now we slice up some shallots, mince up some garlic, and chop up some tarragon. Now we just gotta clean some mussels. Okay. Drink some beer, so I mean, never, cook with some I've beer. Never... But if you squeeze them, and he wants to close back up, he's good. Oh, they don't close, get don't, rid of them. Yep, it. they don't close, don't eat them. Just like when they're cooking, if they don't open, don't force it, right. just throw them so... away. This is called the beard. This is what attaches the muscle to mm -hmm. the rope or pylon or whatever. Right. And so, just gonna yank down on it. Voila. Start cooking your onions on medium heat. Once they begin to caramelize, add in your mussels. In another pan, grill your sausage. How do you know when these are ready? All shellfish, when it's cooked, it'll pop open. I see them, yeah. Yeah, yeah they like to open up real easy. They're there. graceful. Yeah, they're like <laughs> the flower in the morning when it sees yeah. the sun. Throw in your garlic, shallots, a dash of red pepper flakes, your tarragon, your sausage, and some sun-dried tomatoes. Now it's wait. time for the fun part. What's Crack that? a beer. Oh yeah. And the reason we always have two beers out is because you're supposed to be drinking one while you cook, but you know, it's a little early yet <laughs> for some people. Let them simmer for a few minutes, then add in a stick of butter and let it melt. Let's try it. Let's do it. Mmm, they're so tender. Like they don't have a lot of their like distinct flavor. It just, nope. it just soaks up whatever you cook it in. So I you got the spicy the, sausage. The garlic and mm -hmm. the butter. And you can be creative with this too. Oh, I mean, I'll go into my fridge and just start pulling yeah. stuff out and throw it in there. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> to get the recipe, visit wagrown.com. Did you know that most U.S. health organizations recommend eating two seafood meals every week as a part of a healthy and balanced diet? 
One of the benefits to living in the Pacific Northwest is our access to a wide variety of fresh and healthy seafood. Both mussels and black cod, or sable fish, are a great source of protein, which helps us to build and repair tissue and helps our body produce a variety of hormones and enzymes. Protein is also a critical component to building strong bones and muscles and even your blood. Muscles and cod are also a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. These compounds have a wide variety of health benefits, but are especially important for brain and heart health. Finally, both foods are also a great source of vitamin B12, a micronutrient important for nearly every cell in our body because it promotes a healthy metabolism and is critical for proper functioning of nerves. So the next time you are looking to change things up in the kitchen, pick up some nutritious and delicious Washington seafood. Still to come, Tomas is visiting the Manchester Research Station, where he'll learn about a fish called the black cod. Look at the size of that guy. That's a female. <laughs> the size of that gal. Today, we're out on the bay across from Seattle at the Manchester Research Station, where program manager Rick Getz is studying sablefish, a relatively unknown fish that he hopes can become the next staple of aquaculture. My passion really is to get this fish to the next stage. We want to get commercialization of this fish. Well, everything we've done has been geared towards that as an endpoint. We compressed the whole cycle uh, into two years. One of the things is making all females. Okay. So they grow faster. Another thing is, just unlimited amount of food. And we give them the most optimal conditions for growth. And that is the purity of the water and the temperature. And those things are really important in order to maintain this really fast growth. We've worked with these uh, sable fish for a long time, developed a lot of techniques. We think we actually have figured out all the bottlenecks uh, that it right. takes in order to rear this fish. Working with Rick is Kurt Grinnell, councilman for the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Together, the tribe and the research station have developed a program to help the tribe someday farm the sablefish commercially. We fished and hunted along these uh, waters for thousands of years, and so uh, we've always eaten sablefish. So we're just now learning about it. We're behind the curve. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take uh, sablefish and yeah. grow them out in our own uh, net pens here. The Jamestown Squalum, they're actually doing that with us. What it allows us to do is to sort of study the whole process of growing them out. So it's kind of a transfer of technology to the Jamestown Swallum okay. so that they will be able to utilize that in the future if they uh, decide to grow sable fish on their own. There's not more of them to go get. We found okay. them all and so if we're gonna uh, have any more of it we're gonna have to farm them. So these are the tanks? Yeah these are the tanks. The reason why they're here because normally they wouldn't be. They're in colder water and colder water will decrease their growth and we're trying to hold them back because okay. we have a second group of fish and they're much smaller than these fish. But we have to get all of these fish together at the same size. So we're holding these guys back with cold water and we're gonna make those guys go faster with warmer water. And okay. then hopefully in August, and they'll all be the same size. Okay. You don't wanna use fish of different sizes because they grow at different rates. And then, and then they consume feed. food at yes. different rates. It's a very different fish from anything really that's out there. The taste is exquisite. And it's a kind of an oily type meat. has a little bit of high oil in the mussel, but that makes it uh, taste more fishy. Okay. And so uh, people prefer that. But it's hard to find that kind of taste. There are a number of restaurants that do uh, sell it. You could also go to Costco sometime and uh, find it as well. Costco's always got everything, though. Yes, uh, really. <laughs> so should we see one? Yeah. Okay. How do we go about doing that? Well, it's a little bit tough. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be holding this one. Okay. Look at the size of that guy. Oh, that's a female. <laughs> the size of that gal. This is in some anesthesia, so it'll okay. just knock them out just a little bit. So I better not lick my hands or I might pass out, right? Exactly. You <laughs> probably want to wash your hands first. This is a, a really beautiful fish. Uh, and these fish are pampered because they're they're really being used to, to get the eggs to produce everything else. So we take really good care of them. Still a little bit active. <laughs> a little bit longer. Otherwise, you'll be tackling it. <laughs> And that is your black cod. We can almost produce that size fish in two years, yet in the wild, it would take 10 to 12 years to produce that. Well, Rick, thank you so much for showing me the black cod. That's an exciting thing that you guys are working on and I can't wait to try one. All right, you're welcome. <laughs> Come again. <laughs> 
today we're at Seattle Fish Guys, and they're known for their poke Hawaiian style fish. But today we're gonna try their miso black cod, and I can't wait for a taste. Talk to us a little bit about your miso black cod. People do love the black cod, and it, you know, it takes time to make, so we, we sell out a lot. We even had like, I think it was the president of Tendo or somebody ordered, like the, he said it was better than Japan. Well, I think it's uh, time for me to try I, some. Oh yeah, they're delicious. <laughs> Let's go, okay, cheers. Cheers. The flavor, you taste the miso, the it's, sake flavor. It's like heaven. That's what it reminds me of. It's so smooth. It's luxurious. It feels like a silk sheet on my tongue. Like, Let's see what some of the customers here have to say about it. And I understand you like fish. Yes, absolutely. I usually like it poke style. Saltwater yeah. kind of fish. I love it black. I really love cod too, so I'm pretty excited to try it. Dig in. Bon appetit. Wow. That's really good. That's not what I was expecting, but that's really good. Yeah. It's texture, it's sweetness. Yeah, I think I expected salty, and it's more on the sweet side. The fish is so tender. Real soft, juicy. So it doesn't have that super fishy taste. Mm -hmm. It more has a lot of little flavors, little intricacies. So you definitely come back for more, oh, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Something you think you need to take back to Texas? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go grab some right now. <laughs> All right, that sounds great. Well, Tomas and I are in the kitchen here at Second Harvest Food Bank, and we're joined by Chef Laurent Zerati. He is the owner and chef for Fleur de Sel Restaurant, as well as the Creperie in Spokane. Good to see you, Christine. Good to Tomas. see you, too. Good Thanks to for joining it. us yeah. and helping us uh, do some taste testing of some of these recipes. Yes. And we're featuring recipes from allrecipes.com. And uh, today, we're going to be featuring a recipe uh, that involves black cod. Uh, we were talking earlier, and you were saying black cod is like the is upper the echelon of Top of the fish, list for, right? uh, for black cod, yes, <laughs> also called uh, sable fish. Sable fish, and okay. I think uh, Thomas uh, went to see the, uh, visited the fishery, right? I did, I got a chance to see how they were raised in these huge tanks from just nothing to something that was this huge. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at this going, hey, I'm sorry, bud, we're gonna eat you. Yeah. <laughs> so they're big. They're big, yes, and strong. Are they? Yeah, it was cool. Because I haven't seen one before. Yeah. Well, you're going to hear about this one <laughs> on a plate here in a boat. In a different way. <laughs> yeah. In a different way. So the recipe is called Spring Pea Green Curry Black Cod, and it's from Chef John. And uh, Chef John apparently stole it from Al. And so he says, <laughs> sorry, Al. After a few bites, I knew I was going to steal this idea from you. So thanks, Al, as well. And so uh, now we're going to make it, and then we get to taste it. All right. Cannot wait. <laughs> Okay, looks good. So here we have our spring pea green curry black cod. It's gorgeous. And yeah. It's green. It's really green. It's beautiful, the color. What a showstopper, oh, right? Beautiful. I mean, if yes, this yes. would be very, you know, impress your guests, right? right. Yeah, yes, definitely. That's a, that's a restaurant. Uh... Wow, that fish is flaky. Look at it, it just falls mm. apart. Oh. Mm. That's delicious. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. I get that mint and that strawberry. I do. Really nicely. I, you know, I'm not a big uh, fan of uh, strawberries uh, like this on a, on a savory dish, but I right. must say it brings a little bit of a sweetness to the dish, which uh, balance, you know, the, 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 the fish sauce and uh, the, the stock with the peas. And I like it. 
It's delicious, but that cod. I like it too. That cod is fantastic. It's delicious. It's not as um, as fishy as one might think, like when you think of a salmon or something like that. It doesn't no, have no, that kind no. of strong oceanic taste. And the strawberries add a nice color too. It does. Uh, Levin said, oh, we like this a lot, but we didn't bother to strain the sauce. No, um, yeah, because yeah, it's it will, the uh, pea sauce. Yeah, and it, it will make uh, the sauce a little thicker, yeah. you know, and uh, with more texture. This is more soup. -like. It's more like brothy, yes. Brothy, yeah. right. They just used a really good uh, blender and yeah. they didn't think that it was fibrous, so they tried that. And then Laura says, holy yum. <laughs> I like She's that. She's onto something. Oh, yeah. I like Laura. <laughs> and she said uh, she didn't have a strainer either, but she still liked it, so. It's perfect, yeah, you don't have to strain it. And if you want your sauce a little thicker at the end, you could put a little bit of cornstarch mm, when you warm you it up, you know, right. and make it a little thicker. But otherwise, if you like broth kind of, uh, it's perfect. I think it's perfect. We love it. Yeah. Thanks, Chef John. Thank you. Thank you, Appreciate John. <laughs> to get the recipe for this spring pea green curry with black cod and strawberry, visit wagrone.com. The next time you're enjoying some of Washington's tasty seafood, make sure you think of the hardworking aquatic farmers that raise the best there is. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching. <laughs>